Welcome to the Volleyball New Zealand Junior Secondary Schools Referees Course. Firstly, we'll talk about safety. Please ensure you are aware of the emergency evacuation procedures in place for the building you are in. Now let's have a look at what we will cover. We'll start by having a look at the referee pathway. We'll then move on to the uniform and equipment needed for officiating volleyball. We'll talk about professionalism as an official. We'll look at the different parts of the court so you get to know the court. We'll discuss some pre-match tasks that you'll have. And we'll look at communication and how an official communicates with the participants. We'll look at some match responsibilities. We'll then move on to post-match tasks. And we'll finish with where to from here. Firstly, let's have a look at the referee pathway. The pathway begins with the junior secondary school referee. That's what we're doing at the moment. This qualification is for year 9 and 10 students. Senior students can then move on to the local referee qualification, which is completed through your associations. Then you can move on and become a VNZ scorer. From here, the pathway then moves on to the regional referee. However, before doing that, a referee must be a qualified scorer. The pathway then moves on to national referee, and finally on the domestic pathway, to federation referee. However, the pathway doesn't finish there with two more stages above the Federation Referee. Those are the International Referee Candidate and the International Referee. Both of these are administrated by the FIVB, Volleyball's International Governing Body. Now let's have a look at the uniform and equipment that you will need to officiate a match of volleyball. Let's start by looking at the uniform. You are not required to wear a specific volleyball referee uniform for the junior secondary school level. However, you should take the stand looking professional. Do not wear a cap or sunglasses and wear your school tracksuit jacket if you have one. If you don't look the part, the coaches and athletes won't take you seriously. Having a professional appearance is an important aspect of officiating of any sport at any level. Try and take the stand looking like the athlete on the right. Now let's take a look at the equipment that you will need to become a successful volleyball official. Prior to the match it is important to ensure you have the correct equipment to officiate the match. The most important item that you will need is a whistle. You will also need a coin to take the toss. You'll need a watch to time the warm-ups and to ensure that you start on time. Some of you might like to have red and yellow cards, but at this stage that isn't a requirement. A pen just in case, you never know, the scorer might not have one. And, of course, you'll need a copy of the rule book. Now that you look the part and have all the right equipment, it's time to think about professionalism when on the stand as a referee. The fifth part of professionalism that we'll look at 
is being trustworthy. As a referee, it's important that you're trustworthy. You must ensure that you know right from wrong, that you do the right thing, and that you're always responsible for your actions. You also need to be dependable. It is important that you are on time for your match. You should be courtside for officiating your match at least 15 minutes prior to taking the toss. If you have just finished playing, get ready as soon as possible and be ready to take the toss and start the net warm up so the match starts on time. Another important part of being professional is knowing your other officials. Usually though, this isn't a problem because you do duty as a team. But if you don't know your second referee, make sure you introduce yourself. Discuss the match with your second referee. When during the match will you need their help? Make sure they understand what to do during a substitution. Ensure your line judges are also aware of their responsibilities what they need to be looking for during the match. It is important that the participants take part in their chosen sport in a safe environment, so safety is your concern. You must check that the playing area that you will be using is safe, even if there has been a match on the court before yours. Quickly check the floor to ensure that it is free of hazards for example hairpins or anything else that you think might be dangerous. Make sure the area surrounding the court or the free zone is safe and clear of bags and spectators. If you are happy the court is safe it's time to start. If you are unsure, or you think the court or freezer are unsafe for any reason, don't start the match and discuss your concerns with your coach or the competition organiser. At all times, make sure you have a professional attitude. So prior to the match, make sure you look sharp. Ensure you have the correct equipment. And you need to take charge, but make sure that you do that in a diplomatic way. During the match, be impartial, be approachable, and also make sure that you know the rules. After the match, discuss your officiating with your coach and teammates. It's a really good way to learn. And remember, professionalism is knowing how to do it, when to do it, and then doing it. Let's have a look at the different parts of the court. Let's get to know the court. There are different parts of the court that you need to be aware of. There are a few we won't consider today, but we'll look at the main ones now. So the view we have here is looking down on a volleyball court. The first area that we'll look at is known as the free zone. As you can see it's now turned pink and it's the area that completely surrounds the outside of the court. It's known as the free zone. The next zone we will look at is the substitution zone. This is found on both sides of the court and goes from the attack line to the centre line and all the way up to the scorer's table. An athlete walks into this zone to request a substitution when the ball is out of play. The next we will look at is the libero replacement zone. This is also on both sides of the court and is from the end line all the way up to the attack line. And in senior secondary school and club volleyball, the libero player and the regular player have to switch within this zone. The 
The next zone we'll look at is the service zone. The service zone is found at either end of the court and goes from the end line all the way back to the end of the free zone. The final zone we will look at is the front zone. The front zone goes from the middle of the centre line to the rear edge of the attack line on both sides of the court. We will now move on and discuss some of the tasks that you have to complete prior to a match. So the first thing you need to do prior to the match is to ensure you have the correct equipment. Next, talk to your duty team. Ensure they understand their roles and what you expect of them. A poor duty team can make a very good referee look bad. So make sure that they understand exactly what you want of them. The next thing you'll need to do is meet the captains. When you meet the captains for the coin toss, remember to firstly introduce yourself. This is all part of being professional. You need to remind them of any jewellery rules in force for the tournament that you're playing in. And then ask the captains if they have any questions of you. Now it's time to take the coin toss. When you take the coin toss, give the captains a side of the coin each. Don't allow the captains to call heads or tails. And remember, never allow the captains to substitute the coin toss for paper, scissors and rocks. Once the toss has been completed, the first thing you'll need to do is have the captain sign the score sheet. Make sure that they check the score sheet to ensure all the information on it for their team is correct. Inform the scorer of the result of the toss, who will serve and who will receive. The next thing that will happen prior to the match is the warm up. Teams should be in their correct playing uniforms for the warm-up. This is because the scorer will need to check the numbers of the players on the score sheet and compare them with the numbers of the players out on the court warming up. Remember also that for junior volleyball the warm-up or hitting time on the net is usually 3 minutes for each team, with senior volleyball having 5 minutes each for hitting. You'll have a couple of other checks to do prior to the match. You will need to check the score sheet has been completed correctly and the team lists have been filled out and signed by the coach and captain. If this hasn't happened, make sure you chase up both the coach and the captain to ensure it happens prior to the start of the match. You need to check the match ball is at the correct pressure. If you don't have a pressure gauge and you think the ball is flat, inform your coach. Let's now take a closer look at communication. Let's have a look at communication tools that a referee uses during a match. A referee will communicate with a number of different people during a match, for example, spectators, players and coaches. Everyone watching needs to understand what is happening in a match. To help with this, the referee has two major tools at their disposal. Firstly, their whistle, and then the official hand signals. Let's take a closer look at the whistle and its use. The whistle is the referee's most important tool. The whistle needs to be blown immediately a fault has been identified, and its use needs to be loud and crisp. If you blow your whistle immediately, you will then have time to gather information, decide and then indicate the next server without being rushed. Now let's consider the official hand signals. 
There are 25 official volleyball hand signals for the referee. The following are the ones that you are most likely going to have to know. The first hand signal we will look at is the authorization to serve. This is when the referee invites the player to serve the ball over the net. The next hand signal we will look at is the team to serve. The referee simply has to hold their arm out horizontal to the ground to indicate which team will be serving next. To indicate a ball in, a referee just has to point with all their fingers to the centre of the court. There is no need to point to exactly where the ball has landed. To indicate a ball out, a referee has their upper arms parallel to the ground and forearms at 90 degrees with the palms facing towards them. This hand signal is also used to indicate a ball that has contacted the antenna. To indicate the fault of a double contact or two hits, a referee simply has to hold up two fingers. If the team on your left has created the fault, hold up your left hand. If the team of the right is not at fault, hold up your right hand. To indicate the fault of net fault or a ball that doesn't cross the net at service, simply touch the net with the open palm. To indicate the fault of ball touched, simply brush the fingertips of one hand with the palm of the other. For a double fault, or when two players from opposing teams commit a fault at the same time, or for a replay, simply raise two thumbs. To indicate a timeout, make a T with your hands. To indicate a request for substitution, simply rotate your forearms around one another. And finally, for the fault of four hits, raise four fingers on the side of the court that has made the fault. Now let's have a look at the order in which you do your hand signals. At the end of the rally, remember this. One, two, three. One, blow your whistle immediately to stop play. Two, award the point by showing which team is to serve next. And then three, indicate which fault happened and if needed the player at fault. With your hand signals remember the only thing you have to do quickly is blow your whistle. After that take your time. Gather information from your second referee and line judges before making a decision. There are a couple of things to avoid with communication. Firstly, a late whistle, as this gives the impression that you are unsure. Avoid simultaneous hand signals. In other words, having the team to serve and the ball in hand signal out at the same time. And also avoid being too casual. This makes you appear unprofessional and uninterested. Let's now take a look at some match responsibilities. During the match, it is your responsibility to ensure that you stay calm and focused on the job that you have to do. Try and be as consistent as you can in what you do. And as already mentioned, be professional at all times. We're now going to take some time to look at some important rules. We're going to look at the following rules. Firstly, net faults. Then, penetration under the net. Then we'll look at the catch or thrown ball. And we'll finish by looking at serving faults. 
We'll start by looking at net faults. The rules simply state, contact with the net is not a fault unless it interferes with play. The rule makers have made it easy for us and let us know what they consider interfering with play is. Firstly, you interfere or make a net fault if you touch the top tape of the net or the antenna above the net when you are playing the ball. You also are at fault if you take support from the net and play the ball at the same time. You are also considered to be at fault if you are creating an advantage over your opponent. An example of this would be pulling down the bottom of the net so your spiker can hit on a lower net. Also, not allowing an opponent a legitimate attempt to play the ball is a fault. In this clip, a player touches the top tape while in the action of playing the ball. Therefore, it's a fault. In this clip, the blockers contact the lower part of the net, and it is not a fault and play should continue. However, in this clip, the second referee calls a fault. That is because the clip is old and the rules have since changed. We'll now take a closer look at penetration under the net. A player's foot or feet or hand or hands cannot completely cross the centre line. A player's foot or feet or hand or hands can, however, partially cross the centre line. We'll now look at a few photographs to explain this in more detail. In the first photograph, the player's toes are touching the centre line. As the foot has not completely crossed the centre line, no fault has occurred. In the second photograph, the player's foot is halfway across the centre line. As it still has not completely crossed the centre line, no fault has occurred. This would only be a fault if the player stood on their opponent, therefore interfering with their play. In the next photograph, a fault still has not occurred, as the foot has not completely crossed over the centre line. If a part of the foot shadows the centre line, as in this example, no fault has occurred. In this final photograph, the player's foot has completely crossed the centre line, and in this situation, a referee must blow their whistle and call the fault of penetration under the net. In this clip, we will see the setter of the yellow team make the fault of penetration under the net. Their foot completely crosses into the opponent's space and a fault should be called. We'll now have a look at the hand in the centre line. In the first picture, the hand has partially crossed the centre line, but not totally. Therefore, no fault has occurred. In the next picture, the hand has partially crossed the centre line, but not completely. And the shadow of the hand is still above the centre line. Therefore, no fault has occurred. In the final photograph, the player's hand is completely across the centre line, and in this instance, the referees should blow their whistle and call a fault. Also remember that at the junior level, any other part of the body other than the hands and feet that touches the opponent's court is a fault. Also remember that the rules for junior volleyball differ from that of senior secondary school volleyball and club volleyball in regards to the penetration rules. If you would like to learn more, please read your rule books. The next rule we will look at is the catch or throw on ball. The rule simply state the ball must not be caught or thrown. The ball should rebound instantly when it is contacted. If it doesn't, then the fault of a catch has happened. But remember, it is the ball contact that is important and not what the play of the ball looks like. Ugly volleyball is not a fault. 
Let's now have a look at serving faults. The first type of fault that can happen while serving is if the server takes longer than eight seconds after the referee whistles a call to board. If you serve the ball out, it is a fault. And serving the ball into the net is also a fault. Don't forget the player can hit the net and roll over and it's out goal. The next fault we will look at is serving the ball off your hand or not releasing the ball. The final fault for serving we will look at is when the server is standing on the end line when they serve the ball. This is watched by not only the first referee but by the line judge whose responsibility it is to watch that line. Now let's quickly look at some other rules that you will need to remember. Each team has three hits to return the ball to their opponent. If they have more hits than that, the fault of four hits has occurred. Each team can request two timeouts per set, lasting 30 seconds each. And each team can make a maximum of 12 substitutions per set. To win a set, a team must reach 25 points and have a lead of 2 points, except in the 5th set, which is only played to 15 points. However, you'll still need a lead of 2 points to win. We have covered only a limited number of rules in this DVD. If you want to learn more, talk with your coach or contact your local association. A copy of the rulebook can be downloaded from www.fivb Org. Thanks for watching this Volleyball New Zealand Referee Development DVD. We wish you all the best with your refereeing in the future.